without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce Peter Kivash from Oxford, who's going to be talking to us about isoparametric stability. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so this is going to be based on uh, joint papers with uh, various combinations of uh, Ben Barber, Joshua Erder, Noam Lifshitz, Owen Long, Dormincer, and Alexander Roberts. Okay, so uh, here I'm um, various have various pictures illustrating various aspects of isoparametry. So th this is this slide. These pictures are uh, summarizing various topics that I plan to re return to in more detail during the talk. But I'll just run over them briefly now. So, so if I start with the, the circle, this is uh, illustrating the the classical isoparametric uh, problem in the plane, which uh, goes back to the ancient Greeks. So uh, this can be simply stated as saying that if you consider all simple uh, plane enclosed curves of given length, then the, the circle encloses the largest area. Or equivalently, if I consider all uh, shapes in the plane of given area, um, then the, the perimeter uh, when defined is minimized by uh, the circle. Uh, so. My, my convention in these pictures is I'm using red to denote the object that I'm thinking about and blue to denote its parameter or, or boundary. So, uh, of course, if I've drawn it accurately on the circle, it should have zero thickness, but I've uh, fattened it up a bit so you can see it clearly. Uh, so on the left of the slide, uh, you can see two drawings of the three-dimensional cube. Um, so I'm going to be thinking about isoparametry in the cube, not in three dimensions, but in in n dimensions where n is large. Um, so in the top drawing, I'm thinking of the cube as uh, subsets of a, of a uh, so this cube is representing subsets for three element sets. So the set itself is at the top, the empty set at the bottom, and then there is, there's a level of sets of size one and a level of sets of size two. And, the, so the, and this is a graph where the edges uh, are joining uh, sets that differ by one element. Um, and so there are two natural notions of isoparametry in a graph. Um, so this picture is illustrating the notion of vertex isoparametry. So uh, the set which I'm looking at is uh, illustrated by the red points and the blue points are the vertex boundary. So these are the points which are not in the set but are adjacent to something in the set. Uh, and this picture is also illustrating how you minimize the vertex boundary for a set of given size in the cube, if, if you can, you take a, a Hamming book, so all points within given distance of some particular point. Uh, so the picture below uh, is another drawing of, of the cube, which is illustrating the other natural notion of isoparametry, um, uh, so or boundary. So this is the uh, edge boundary. So here I'm drawing the uh, in blue the edges which go from the from the set to its complement. Uh, and again, I'm illustrating a minimizer for the edge isoparametric problem, which is how do you minimize the, the number of edges leaving the set for a given size? So if, if the size of your set happens to be that of a subcube, then you should take a subcube. So here I'm illustrating a, a subcube of co-dimension one. Um, and also next to it, you can see some um, illustrations of some applications of, of this uh, isoparametric uh, uh, theory. So it's, it's nice in its own right, but it also is uh, important, particularly in, in the uh, uh, when thinking about uh, thresholds of monotone properties. So, uh, so there's a natural way to tran translate. So if, let's say I'm thinking about a graph property. I could think of that as a, uh, so it's a set of graphs, which is a, a subset of a cube in which the, uh, the coordinates are indexed by the edges of a complete graph. That's just a way to translate the idea of a set of graphs. Um, and, and then I could also think of a set of graphs as, as a Boolean function, which just takes the values one on, on if, if you're uh, in the set and zero not in the set. So different ways of thinking about the same thing. Um, and so this is a helpful perspective uh, because the, um, so the um, if I'm thinking about whether my property is likely to occur in a random graph GNP, then this is the same thing as looking at, as, at the p-biased measure of the associated Boolean function. Um, and this is 
So this is a, a well-studied uh, thing from the point of view of the anal analysis of Boolean functions. There's a classical way of in interpreting the derivative of this of this measure as in terms of the uh, the influence, which is a, a form of of edge boundary, and so um, anyway, I'll say more about that later. But it's a, um, that's what this uh, this picture is illustrating. So the uh, understanding the um, a, a weighted version of the edge boundary can help us understand uh, thresholds of monotone properties. So this is a uh, was a breakthrough uh, um, idea of free code. Uh, so okay, moving across the slide, so the, the remaining pictures are illustrating isoprometry and lattices, which I've, I've drawn these in two dimensions, but they could be in any number of dimensions. Um, so I've got two pictures illustrating um, the, uh, the uh, isoprometry when I'm thinking about the lattice and just nearest neighbor uh, graph, so the uh, uh, joining every point to its up, down, left, right neighbors. Um, and again, um, we can think about how to minimize the vertex boundary, how to minimize the edge boundary, and, the, and you can see illustrations there of, of how to do this from the top for the vertex boundary and on the bottom for the, uh, uh, the edge boundary. Um, so these are, uh, uh, um, yeah, sorry, I haven't mentioned any of the attributions. So for the, I'll come to these later, but for the, for the cube, uh, there are various uh, authors in the 60s who proved these results. And then for the, the uh, isoprometry in the grid, these are results from the 80s of uh, Bolabash and Leder, and one was independently by Wang and Wang. Um, and then, so moving to the, now to the right of the slide. So, so here I am thinking not just about uh, joint nearest neighbors in, in the lattice, but uh, fixing any generating set and looking at the isoprometry with respect to the, uh, uh, the associated Cayley digraph on the lattice. And this is equivalent to thinking about uh, some sets where I've, um, I've, I've fixed some sets, um, so in, which is illustrated by the green vectors. And then I'm thinking, well, um, how am I going to choose my red set to minimize the, right, so if I call those green vectors B and, and my red set A, how am I going to choose A to minimize the size of the sum set A plus B? Um, and so, so here we don't know uh, exact answers, but uh, an approximate answer for the, uh, the vertex uh, boundary, which is illustrated at the top, is, is due to Ruzia. So this, this picture there uh, is a uh, a certain convex progression, which is associated in a, uh, to these these vectors, you can see the the pattern uh, from the uh, from the picture. Uh, so uh, and so that's for the uh, the vertex boundary, and then below um, is an illustration for the edge boundary, uh, and this is a, a result of Barbara and Erd. Um, and uh, one final part to comment on the picture is uh, at the top, uh, top right is an illustration of, a, of another continuous isoprometry problem. And this is for uh, a certain uh, anisotropic perimeter. So um, I'm thinking about perimeter not in the, in the standard way, but where I, some directions are favored more than others according to a particular convex body. And so um, the, uh, when the convex body is the one drawn there, then the um, this that triangle, then the minimizer is a, a appropriate rescaling of the triangle, and this is a, so this um, so this is a well studied uh, problem in geometric measure theory, and the uh, and the connection between this continuous problem and the discrete problem will be in, important for us. Okay, so this is a, a summary of the of the topics which I'm planning to talk about. So maybe let's get started. Um, so we go back to the Euclidean setting. Um, so just remind you the statement. So the, if we look at plane curves of given length, then uh, the circle encloses the largest area. Um, so there are several classical proofs of this based on variation uh, or arguments, but these all suffer from a, a gap of assuming the existence of, of the minimizer, which is a non-trivial thing to prove. Um, a different approach is just to, to prove a quantitative um, 
inequality, which um, says, um, well, you can see that the minimizer is, is the circle. So that's stated here, the isoparametric inequality, L squared is at least four pi A, where L is the length and A is the area. And that's a type of the circle. Um, so in D dimensions, the corresponding inequality is stated there. So the, uh, uh, the perimeter set S to the power D is at least D to the D times the volume of the unit ball times the volume of the set to the power T minus one. Um, to get some intuition uh, for this formula, you could uh, derive it from the Brun-Minkowski inequality. So that's the, the next two lines there. So if I apply the Brun-Minkowski inequality to the set and a ball of radius epsilon, then I get what's written there. Um, and then I can uh, calculate the, uh, the perimeter for suitably nice sets. Uh, by, so I, I look at my set S and I, I fatten it by epsilon. So that's S plus epsilon B, taking the Minkowski sum there. And, I, and then I'm looking at what, what's new, what do I get from that which wasn't in my original set rescale that by epsilon and take the limit of epsilon to zero and that's the uh, the perimeter of my set um, and if you put that into the Brim-Minkowski inequality then you get the, uh, the stated bound um, so this is all about the uh, um, the isoparametric inequality um, now let me turn to stability so when stability in this context um, I mean uh, saying something about the structure of sets which are approximately extremal. So if a set is, um, is close to having minimum possible perimeter, um, must it be close to, to a ball? Um, and so an approach uh, that started in the early uh, 20th century was uh, to uh, prove a, a sharpening of the isoparametric inequality, which uh, quantifies this uh, this isoparametric deficit, this uh, quantity which L squared minus four pi A in the plane, which we know is not negative, uh, bound this by something in terms of the set, so that we know that if L squared minus four pi A is small, then it tells us something about the set. So it, there are various inequalities of this kind. This this one which I've highlighted here is about the uh, is measuring the difference uh, between the radio of, a, of a, uh, a, circums of a, a circle that contains my set, a circle which is contained within my set. And so if, those are, if, the, if that difference is small, then my set is close to being a circle. Um, so there's a, a large literature obtaining these kinds of quantitative results. And the, uh, the sharp result in this direction was obtained by uh, Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli, um, who, uh, so they gave the, uh, the relationship which bounds the asymmetry um, which is the, a measure of how similar a set is to, to a ball in terms of the isoparametric deficit, which is the uh, measuring how tight the isoparametric inequality is to being inequality. Um, and so the inequality with the, which they, they established that, is, that the asymmetry is at most root of the deficit is uh, times a, a constant is sharp up to, the, to that constant. Okay. Um, so now let me go to the discrete setting. So um, re returning again to the cube. So um, I'm thinking about the cube in n dimensions. So vectors of binary vectors of length n, where the edges are joining vectors that differ in exactly one coordinate. And then I'm looking at the edge boundary, which are edges which have one point in the set and another point not in the set. Um, so I want to know how small that can be given the size of the set. Um, and so there's a, so this problem was solved in the 60s by various authors. Um, and I haven't stated the full result. They can, it's actually um, known exactly what the minimizers are, but I'm, I'm just stating it in a, in a short form, which is uh, sufficient for what I want to talk about here. So, um, and this is, and the way I phrased it, on the left, I've got an inequality where on the, on the left, I'm looking at the average degree of a point in the boundary, in the edge boundary. Uh, and on the right, I've got something which would be the co-dimension if I was looking at a subcube. So if, um, if I'm looking at a set of size 2 to the n minus 1, then on, on the right, I've got, I've got 1. Um, so this is an inequality which is sharp for uh, subcubes and holds for um, any subset of the cube. Um, uh, so as, 
So that's the isoparametric inequality. Uh, so for stability, so as before, we are saying, well, what if it, what what can we say about the structure of sets which are close to extremal? So this was the subject of a, a conjecture of Bolabash, Leder, and Riordan proved by Ellis. Um, and so, and here, so we, we assume that the average bound degree is, is within an additive, small additive constant, epsilon of the minimum possible. And the conclusion is that the set is uh, very close to a subcube. Um, and, and this, uh, according to this formula, which is, uh, which is uh, tight. Um, now you might think, well, this is a very, uh, we're making a very strong assumption here, uh, assuming the bounds degree with, is within an additive constant for minimum. Can we say anything with, under a weaker condition? Um, so this is the subject of the conjecture of Kahn and Kalai. Um, so this is from a paper with several nice conjectures around the, the subject of isoprometry um, and also uh, thresholds of properties. I'll, I'll say more about these conjectures later. Um, so I haven't stated their conjecture precisely because actually um, what they stated was too strong as disproved. But the, uh, the spirit of their conjecture is, is uh, that you should be able to say uh, some give some structure when the uh, um, the average uh, boundary degree is small, and um, the natural structure to expect would be a union of of the uh, of the extreme example, a union of, of subcubes. Uh, so this was proved uh, by Keller and Lifshitz, and independently by myself and Long. Um, so we showed that um, if the average boundary degree is within an additive constant of the minimum. Um, then your your family must indeed be close to a union of subcubes, where uh, the number of subcubes is just a function of this constant k of how close you are to, to uh, the the boundary degree is to minimum and epsilon uh, the accuracy of the approximation, but it doesn't depend on the, the dimension. Um, so uh, this this constant uh, so uh, the uh, Two papers uh, had very different proofs of this uh, of this result, and the, in fact, the, uh, the the proof of Keller and Lifshitz gives a, a sharper estimate. So this uh, they determine that this constant uh, behaves uh, doubly exponentially in K over epsilon, and that's tight for uh, tribes uh, and a canonical example in, in, in this uh, subject. Um, so this this was all about the. Uh, edge boundary. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's another natural notion of boundary in, the, uh, in a graph, which is the vertex boundary. So here we're looking at vertices which are not in the set and are adjacent to something that is in the set. Um, and again, I've got this picture here, which is illustrating the um, how to minimize the vertex boundary. Um, this is a, a, a result of Harper uh, from the 60s. Um, Again, uh, there's a the full result gives you a precise answer for uh, any size of set, which is uh, somewhat complicated to state, and uh, don't want to get into it uh, now. So I'm just stating it for the particular case where uh, the size of the set it happens to be that of a Hamming ball, and then uh, the the inequality says, well, the best thing you can do to to minimize the vertex boundary is to take a Hamming ball. So if the size of your set is the sum of all binomial coefficients and choose i, where i is at least k, then you take that corresponding ball and then the, the vertex boundary has size n choose k minus one. Um, so um, now the, uh, there's a, right, for the edge boundary, there was a, a fair bit of uh, previous work on stability uh, before as a result, but uh, for the vertex boundary, there was, essentially nothing um, before uh, uh, quite recently uh, we obtained a stability result. So independently, uh, myself and Long and uh, Sutsky and, and Roberts uh, showed, so roughly a rough statement is that if the uh, vertex boundary is close to minimum, then uh, your set has to be close to a ball. Um, I'm not stating uh, these results precisely because um, Right, I've given you a statement of part of uh, 
uh, of our result with long uh, below, uh, which is just for the case when the size of, this, um, of the set is, is that of the ball, but the, uh, things become more complicated for other sizes and there are, there's non-uniqueness of extremal examples. I don't want to get into those things here, but just the, uh, the it's a more it seems to be a more complicated type of uh, stability uh, question. Um, and uh, it's perhaps more difficult but to deal with because the, the known proofs of, of uh, isometry involve um, compression. So this is uh, where you, you, you take some family, you make repeatedly make modifications to it and push it towards uh, the extremal example. Um, so which is can be a useful way of proving an inequality, but it's it's hard to then recover structural information about your original family up from following this process. Um, so, so um, a couple of other comments about these results. So the uh, um, so the results the two the two papers are complementary in that uh, uh, their re result applies for when. Uh, the radius of the ball is little o log n, but then gives a, a sharper estimate for the stability, whereas um, our result uh, applies for um, all, any radius of ball, but it gives a, a weaker estimate on the stability. Um, and, and you'll see from the, uh, the assumption on the vertex boundary in the bottom line that, that it's quite a strong assumption. I'm not assuming a, just a one plus little o one factor in front of the minimum, and it's a, a one plus order one over n factor. And so we don't know how to say anything about the structure of, of sets which are just within a one plus little o one factor of, of the optimum for this problem. Okay. Um, so next, I want to go on to the, the setting of uh, sunsets or uh, isoperimetry in uh, K digraphs. Um, a quick, uh, different ways of thinking about the same question. Um, so, of course, the, uh, the motivating uh, question in the background is, um, is what can we say about the structure of sets um, A with small doubling? So, uh, it's the subject of the, uh, the polynomial Frank and Ruger conjunction. Uh, but so, here, I, instead of, I want to think about a variant where I've got some fixed set B, which is generating Z to the D. And, and then I'm thinking about a large set A and I want to say, what is the, uh, well, what, what is, first of all, what is the uh, minimum possible size of the sum set A plus B? And then given that, what are the, can you say, describe the structure of approximate minimizers? Um, and so below there, I'm just explaining the connection to the, uh, uh, to the uh, isoperimetry. So um, I'll assume that my set B contains zero, and then I can write this the difference between a plus the sum set a plus b and a as uh, a vertex boundary where I'm looking at the Cayley digraph. So I'm, my directed edges go from x to x plus b for any x in in the lattice and b, which is in my set. Um, so, so as I said earlier, we don't know how to solve this problem exactly, minimizing the uh, the, the boundary or the sum set. Uh, but a, an approximate answer was given by Ruja, and he showed that the uh, the best thing you can do, roughly, is to take a, a convex progression. So uh, uh, you take uh, the convex hull of your of your set B and rescale it so that it has about n points in, when you intersect it with the lattice, and that's uh, essentially the best thing you can do. So that's illustrated on on, on the left. There's a three. Uh, three particular vectors um, which I'm using and then I form their convex hole which is uh, this triangle and then I um, blow that up by an appropriate amount and, and take the lattice point which are inside. Um, so with uh, Barber, and Erdi and Roberts we uh, proved a stability version of this and so uh, this is saying so if the uh, vertex boundary is, is within a factor uh, one plus little o one of the minimum, um, then the set is close um, to, uh, uh, to an extremal example. Um, and I've written out the uh, the dependence because it's uh, 
the dependence on epsilon here is is, is sharp, is uh, square root dependent. So it's uh, I may remind you of, of the, uh, the, re the result I mentioned earlier in the continuous setting, this uh, uh, quantitative uh, relationship between the um, the uh, uh, asymmetry and isoparametric, def isoparametric deficit, and and this is where it comes from, and I'll explain a, a bit more about that uh, soon. Um, and then for the edge boundary, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, Barbara and Erda showed that the uh, the minimum is approximately achieved by um, so the similar uh, similarly it's a convex progression, but now uh, the the, the uh, the body which we're looking at is is the convex hull of all of the uh, subset sums. Um, so then we rescale that appropriately. Uh, and again, we have a, a stability version of, of this. Um, and here um, I've just stated it um, in the just with little o notation because the uh, the relationship between the error terms is is much weaker due to it, it, the proof is via a, a probabilistic reduction to Ruge's result, which is also the case in the proof of Barbara and Erda in their result. Um, and so there's some loss in accuracy in, in, that, in that proof. So we don't know what the, the sharp relationship is between um, the stability there. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll switch to the, the whiteboard and say a bit about the, uh, some ideas of, of the uh, proof. Uh, with, so the first result is uh, uh, stability for the um, the vertex boundary or, or the uh, equivalently the uh, stability for a plus b given uh, okay Okay, hopefully you see the whiteboard. Okay, so what's the, uh, the setup here? So um, you've got some, uh, so we fix some uh, B, which is uh, generating uh, Z to the D. Uh, and we want to, and we're thinking about a subset of z to the d size n, and and we're trying to understand when the size of a plus b is is small. So let me call that uh, size of a plus b one plus c n. Um, and so so following Ruscha, the first thing we're going to do is apply uh, Planicka's inequality. Uh, Uh, so for any k, I can uh, find some, I can write uh, a prime plus kb at most 1 plus c to the kn. So k, there exists um, a prime subset of a non-empty. Okay. Um, and now I want to, sorry, I mean, a, I mean on the right hand side, I meant um, the size of A prime. Not that it makes much difference because it will turn out the size of A prime is very close to mine. Um, and now I want to, so I want to move this towards a continuous setting. So I want to rewrite th these uh, in terms of, uh, so, so I want to write this as mu, a prime plus KB plus Q, and this as mu of A prime plus Q, um, where, so uh, Q is a, a fundamental domain for the lattice. So, um, so any element in R to, D, R to the D can be uniquely represented as an integer vector plus an element of Q. Um, and if I choose this Q carefully, then I can arrange that this here is uh, roughly equal to the same thing where instead of uh, B, um, I've got the convex hull of B.
There you go. Um, and now I want to apply uh, Bruninkowski. So, uh, so I want to do this with, uh, so I'm gonna write it and then uh, write it in a general form. So I'll write mu, mu plus V to the one over D is at least mu V to the one over D plus mu and V to the one over D. And I'm gonna take uh, V to be K times C of B and U to be uh, A prime plus Q. Um, so then I'm going to get that this is, um, uh, so I've got size of A prime. Uh, so mu of U is one is size of A prime because Q is a fundamental domain. So size of A prime to the one over D plus uh, K times uh, mu of C of B to the one over D or to the power D. So that's my lower bound for the left-hand side. Um, oh, sorry, mu is um, is just Lebesgue measure. Um, um, and, uh, and then my upper bound as from, from above is one plus C to the K size of A prime. Uh, and then I so want to say that this is on the right, just just taking the main terms that this is about one plus kc times size of a prime. And then this is about size of a prime plus d times k times mu to the one over d. I just write mu for mu of cb. Um, so we see from this that, um, that the, uh, uh, I should be thinking of, of c as being uh, about, uh, I've dropped a factor somewhere. Uh, I've got a size of it. This is size of a prime, so the one minus one over t. Yeah. So you should be thinking of c as being about uh, uh, d times mu to the one over d times n to the minus one over t, because you you can you can derive from this that the size of a prime is about the size of the original set n. Um, so this is. This is Rusch's approach for uh, getting a lower bound on on this on the size of a plus b, um, and but we want to think about uh, the stability of this. So what what can we say when this this inequality is is uh, close to tight? Um, and so so here this is the um, where the it's we we think of it in terms of the uh, anisotropic. Uh, uh, in, isoprometric inequality I mentioned before. So, uh, so, so now I'm, I'm looking at the, the, uh, the perimeter of some set E with respect to some convex body K. Um, and this is, uh, sorry, so, and I'm thinking about E uh, sufficiently nice that this makes sense. So not to get into the, some of the technicalities uh, which arise for general sets of finite parameter. Uh, so I'm looking at E and now I'm going to thicken it by um, epsilon in according to this K rather than whereas in, I'm going to write the same thing that I wrote before uh, when discussing it the perimeter in general, but now in, I, I've written the same thing as before, but I've replaced the unit ball by this, some particular body uh, K. Um, and so there's a corresponding um, isoperimetric inequality that this is, um, this is minimized when uh, uh, E is uh, homothetic to K. I don't have to write that, I can just write. Uh, and just like R times B, so just re rescaling a B. Um, and and there's also a, so this is the isoparametric inequality, and there's also a corresponding uh, quantitative stability result, which was obtained by uh, Figali, Maggi, and, and Pratelli. And it's, it's the same result that I stated earlier, Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli 
um, for the, in the setting when the usual uh, isoponetry, uh, but just with this anisotropic isoponetry. So let's, let me just restate it in the setting. So the, the asymmetry uh, is bounded by some constants and some depending on the dimension times the square root of the isoparametric deficit. I won't restate what those things mean. Um, so the, the connection uh, to what I've written above is you can see as if you think about the set, uh, I consider uh, AR for any R, which is, uh, so I'm gonna take A primed plus R times convex hull of B plus Q. And, um, and then the, so the perimeter with respect to CB of AR is the derivative or of, a, of, of the measure of AR. So it's, well, it's the right derivative. So. So if you just, if you, I know this is going a bit fast, but if you stare at the definitions, put them in, you see that that's, that's, that's just another way of, of, of uh, saying what the, uh, the, the perimeter is in this context. Um, so, um, and if you look at what, what we know of uh, the calculation above, if I'm assuming that that inequality is close to, close to sharp, then I have a bound on f of k, uh, Uh, minus f of zero. So this sort of gradient from zero to, to, to k of, of this thing is, is bounded above by what I've written there. It's, it's, uh, I'm assuming it's about um, uh, c times uh, size of a, which is about as small as it can be. Um, and by a form of the mean value theorem, you can you can find the value of r where where the perimeter is that small. So, we, what, what we've in this what we've done by this translation is we've gone from the tightness and in inequality to something where uh, the, the, this uh, anisotropic perimeter is, is close to being as small as possible. And so then we can just appeal to this this result. I, I uh, this is a uh, Carly Maggi and Brutelli um, saying that so we've so the isoparametric deficit is small, then the um, asymmetry is, is small. So it must be close to the a rescaling of this convex body. Um, so that's a, um, a sketch of the, uh, the argument. Um, okay, so I'll go back to the slides. Okay, so let's see. So, so this so this was um, all about various isoparametric problems. So now I want to return a bit to say something about some of the applications which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so this was uh, to do with the connection between um, uh, isoparametry and thresholds of uh, properties. So, so here we're thinking about the erdos renyi random graph GMP, uh, and I mentioned that. You can think of a, a graph property as, as a subset of graphs on a given set, um, so set of n vertices. And then I also want to think of that in terms of the associated Boolean function. So I just have a take the value one for a graph which has the property and zero for a graph that doesn't have the property. Um, and then I can s s uh, think of the probability that GMP has my property as the p by s measure of this Boolean function. So the, it's a product measure where every coordinate is one with probability p and zero otherwise. 
Um, and so there's this uh, classical lemma of Margulis and Rousseau, which says that the, um, if we look at the, the rate of change of this uh, mu p of f, so this, uh, this uh, p biased measure, which is the, the likelihood that GMP has my property, then I can interpret that as the influence of the function. And I, I won't write out the precise definition, but you can think of this as a, uh, uh, the edge boundary weighted according to, to mu p. Um, so, uh, and this is uh, powerful in combination with the theorem of Friedgut, uh, which gives a uh, structural characterization of uh, monotone functions with small influence. So if the influence is bounded by a constant, then the, the function is, is close to a hunter. So this is a, means a function which only depends on a small number of coordinates. So um, as illustrated in, in this picture, so that if, it, if it just depends on one uh, coordinate, then this is a, a subgroup of co-dimension one. It's also called a dictator. There's a one coordinate whose, de whose decision decides the value of the function. Um, so the, the slogan that summarizes Friedrich's approach here is, is that if, if, a function, if a property has a coarse threshold, then it can be approximated by a, a local property. So it's, um, it's just a, a few coordinates, which just correspond to edges of the graph, which determine whether uh, the property holds or not. So for example, this could be the property that, uh, of containing a triangle. Um, so if you just specify three edges then, um, and right, so this is illustrating the, um, yeah. So um, the, okay, so then, uh, so the next question here, so this is uh, another question of Karen and Kalai on, on the same paper. So this is, uh, um, I s stated here, the, um, the, the uh, p-weighted version of the edge isoprometric inequality. Um, and so they ask, well, again, in, what can you say about the structure um, of functions which are close to type for this um, this inequality? Um, and this is this is something which we, we know rather less about in um, in the, uh, the the case of uniform measure. Um, and they also had a particular motivation for asking this question, uh, which was which is the, the this question relating the, the thresholds. So the, uh, the for a property is that can you bound the, the, the critical probability the, um, at which the um, uh, which the uh, the the uh, property goes from being unlikely to occur to being likely to occur. So say passing through the value half um, in terms of the um, expectation threshold, which is uh, uh, so I've stated that. Um, abstractly there, but you can think of it in terms of um, if I, my property is characterized by uh, the appearance of a particular subgraph, then what is the probability at which I expect to see that subgraph in, in expectation? More, more precisely, I expect to see all subgraphs of that graph in case it's, there's a, a subgraph which is harder to, to find. Um, and so the, uh, so Kahn and Kalai suggested that um, an approach to this conjecture could be via um, characterizing functions which have coarse thresholds. So if the threshold is sharp, then you would expect the, uh, that the critical probability should be close to the expectation threshold and, um, and otherwise you should be able to characterize the property. Uh, uh, and this, um, this would be, a, if this conjecture approved, um, it would be subsume a lot of specific results for thresholds of, um, of, of properties. Um, and in fact, so there's been a recent breakthrough in this direction, not, not via isoprometry, but uh, a different approach. So Frankston, Kahn, Marianne, and Park uh, proved a, a fractional re relaxation of this kahn kalai conjecture, which was suggested by Telegram. Um, and this, this is still sufficient for many of the applications, such as the uh, Johansson kahn vu result on uh, Shamir's problem, so the threshold for a matching in a hypergraph or the um, uh, Montgomery's results on spanning trees in, um, in about the banded degree in, uh, in random graphs. These will follow from this, this more general approach in terms of thresholds. Okay. Um, so 
here on this slide, I want to think a bit more about the the connection between um, the, uh, the so this trade-off between the well, what, what you can say about functions of, of uh, small influence. So, uh, so starting by um, restating uh, Friedrich's result that if a function has uh, bounded influence, then it's close to a hunter. Um, so if we look a bit more carefully about the, st at the statement here, so the, uh, the constants, uh, the number of coordinates uh, which the function depends on is, is a function of this constant k, the approximation parameters are epsilon and the probability with respect mu p with respect to which we're uh, looking at the p bias measure, um, and so and the because we're we're looking at the approximation of the f up to a, a function of measure epsilon, so it, we're only interested in applying this function to in applying this in, this uh, approximation to functions where the measure of my function is is bounded away from zero and one. Otherwise, we could just approximate by a trivial function. Um, so the scope for sharpening this result, and this was achieved soon after by Bourgain, um, who uh, gave a result still in, in this dense regime, but which applies for any p. So there's, there's no um, removing the p dependence here. Um, and so here the right assumption is to assume that the if you re multiply the influence by p, then that's bounded. Um, and what the conclusion he obtained is that you can uh, you get uh, some correlation with a, a subcube of small co-dimension. So rather than saying you can approximate by a, a, a cube or a union of cubes, which is, would be a, a much stronger structural statement, you can at least say there is some local structure. You get some correlation with a subcube. So uh, the notation I'm using here is I'm taking some set of coordinates j, fixing and setting all of those bits equal to one, and then looking at the associated function, which we get, um, and I'm thinking about a monotone function, so that I, I can just set all the bits to one as opposed to some other vector. Um, so he showed that you do get some correlation, um, and so with uh, Lifshitz, Long, and Minso, we showed we improved the uh, the estimate for the correlation, which you get. The, you get a correlation which is uh, e to the minus constant times k, and this is. Uh, the, the best you can hope for because of the, the example of tribes. Um, and we also have a similar result, which is uh, applies in the sparse regime. So we're not no longer assuming that the measure is bounded away from zero and one. Um, and here the, the natural assumption is to assume that you're, uh, you're looking at, again, p times the influence and bounding it by a constant times the measure of your function. And again, the similar conclusion, you can get the a correlation um, on a subcube with the, um, this estimate. So you can think of this as, as, as a result in the direction of the, uh, this question of Kakan and Kalai on characterizing the structure of the uh, functions which are of small influence. Um, and so the, um, the, the proofs of these results are interesting in that they uh, rely on a, a, a new hypercontractive inequality. So the Hypercontractive inequality is is a, an important result, which is applied starting from um, the paper of Kahn, Kalai, and, and Lineal, and also by Friedgott, and, and, and met to many problems in the analysis of Boolean functions. And uh, uh, and this is saying that you can uh, control uh, uh, the four norm of your function in terms of the two norm after you apply some noise to it. So this is a, a, di a different kind of think of it as a different kind of isoparametric. Uh, operation or boundary operation where um, instead of flipping an edge, we're we're, uh, uh, we're flipping all of the, doing something to all of the coordinates. So we're, we're looking at the, uh, we're taking our function and replacing it by the value of x by an average over uh, a distribution of, of points y where um, each coordinate is either equal to its original value with some probability or or resample with some probability. So this is a, a noisy version of the function. Um, and so the so the hypercontractive inequality gives says that you can estimate the uh, uh, the four norm of the of the noisy version of the function in terms of the two norm. Uh, but this is um, the the uh, the inequality which you get is 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 too weak to say anything useful in, in the sparse regimes. So the uh, um, the, the key property of our new inequality is, is that it, it, it we characterize the, the obstruction. So it's, it's 
fits into the, the theme of this talk in that it's a um, it's exploiting the idea of stability. So it's, it's saying, well, either you're close to one of the tight examples for the hypercontractive inequality, if you're close to it, which are hunters, those are the ones for which the inequality, you don't get a very sharp inequality, um, or uh, your function is not close to a hunter, it's not well approximated by a um, uh, function depending on a few coordinates, and then you get a much sharper inequality. Um, Let's see, so, so maybe what, we can have time to just go through a, a slide on so applications of, of so further applications. So this is uh, of um, how these um, ideas about hunters have applications to problems in extremal combinatorics. Um, and the, the, the prototype for the kind of question which I'm interested in here is a uh, classical result of Erdős, Kier, and Rado, which is uh, uh, describing uh, the maximum size of an intersecting family of k element sets. So if I'm, I'm living on a ground set of size n, size at least 2k, and I want to take sets of size k such that every two um, intersect, then the best I can do is, is to take a star, or if I think of it as a function of dictator. So there's one element which is in all of the sets, and that determines membership of the family. Um, so in, in, the, in the context of this talk, I'm thinking about stability. So I'm, I want to describe the structure of, of large uh, intersecting uh, families. Um, and this is a, a classical topic in combinatorics. So there's various results for, uh, saying that you, you can describe the structure that these, these sets, they have a, a small kernel. So there's, uh, in terms of the language I've been using here, that they're roughly contained in an intersecting uh, set system which only depends on a membership only depends on a few elements um, and the connection to the the results I was mentioning before was to, um, was discovered by more recently by Dinier and Frieger to, uh, uh, who has, um, realized that if the, the Margulis Russo lemma applied to the um, if you think about the your, your family and you 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 uh, close it up, you take the family that it generates, um, that tells you there is some P for which the influence is small. Um, and then you can, and then Frigot's result tells you that this, that, uh, your family is, is approximated by a hunter. And then you can do some additional arguments to see that this, this must be intersecting. Um, so this is a, um, a powerful idea, but the, the significance was only developed much more recently by Keller and Lifschitz, who uh, generalize this substantially. So uh, you can think of the problem of intersecting families as ex extremal problem for a matching of size two. And, and they realize that you can actually do this for, if you take any fixed hypergraph and expand it to a, um, to a, a collection of K sets by adding new vertices to each edge, then you can get a corresponding approximation result. It says that any, any family not containing your configuration can be is approximately contained in a hunter not containing a configuration. So this is a very powerful for proving extremal results. Once you know the approximate structure, you can then pin down the exact structure. Um, and so we uh, applied this, um, this idea to a, um, a conjecture which is uh, derives from the well-known conjecture of uh, Erdős, this Erdős matching conjecture, which is asking about the maximum size of a family of sets with no matching of size two, uh, of size s, where um, Odoch Corrado being the case of sets of size two. Um, and so the so this conjecture is still open, but important progress towards this was made by Frankel, who showed that when n is at least constant times s times k, then the um, there's a natural construction which is optimal, which is to take all, all sets containing some fixed set of size s minus one. And this um, this estimate on n is sharp up to the constant. Um, so we recently proved a, a cross version of this. So we're, we're thinking about now s families, which where there's no matching, which is cross, so one set from each. And the conclusion is, is similar that, that one of the families is most as big as, as a star. Uh, so this was uh, a, a conjecture of uh, Huang Lo and Sudikar food proved it under the assumption that n is at least uh, 3sk squared. And, and so we uh, got the similar dependence as in Frankel's 
um, result that m just needs to be constant times sk. Uh, and the sort of key ingredient here is that it's following this, this Hunzer approach, but re replacing this application of Brigitte's theorem by this new uh, result, which we obtained um, on thresholds versus Hunzer's, which also applies in, in so it, it, you can see that if, if S and K are functions of N, then we can't assume that the, that the measure and the, the, the probability are, are bounded away from zero and one. Um, okay, so just, just to wrap up, so, um, so I mentioned several isoparametric kind of problems in this talk and, and, and I've been talking about the stability. So the, the phenomenon that uh, uh, sets a close to uh, extremal, close to having minimum possible boundary, um, we can say they characterize their approximate structure, that they're, they're close to the extremal example. Um, and they say usually this approximate and with an impact of one plus a little low one, although in the for the vertex isoparametric problem in the cube, I made a stronger assumption. Um, um, and so, of course, it's natural to ask what we can say under weaker assumptions. And rather than assuming a factor of one plus a little low one, can we say anything about sets where the, uh, the boundary is within just a constant factor at the minimum? Um, and I, I mentioned some results in this direction for the edge boundary and the influence, but generally we don't know very much about this. Um, and so in the, in the spirit of various conjectures in this direction, the Karen Pillai conjectures, which I mentioned, and uh, the Feynman Ruzsa uh, conjecture on the structure of sets of small doubling, um, we, we might imagine that uh, the approximate structure should be roughly described as you, sh you should be able to cover your set by a small number of cannot canonical examples, which are not much bigger than the set. It seems like a natural thing to, to believe. And of course, the, the meaning of canonical examples will depend on what problem you're looking at. Um, and then if you can prove something like that, then you might also ask, well, what are the relationships between the implied constants? Is, are they really, do they have a polynomial relationship? All right, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs>